Thank you everyone for joining us for this online workshop for um, anonymization techniques for social science research data. My name is Maureen Haker and I am a qualitative specialist working with the UK Data Service. I've worked for over 10 years now on everything from um, ingesting qualitative collections, answering queries, um, and reuse projects for qualitative collections. I'm going to be joined later on in this session by my colleague, um, Christina Magder, and she is our data collections development manager. Um, she's just uh, with one of our research councils at the moment, actually, so she's she's going to be joining in about a half hour or so. What we're planning on doing today is to give you a bit of background on anonymization, why it's important, um, perhaps some of the um, theoretical underpinning there, what are some of your legal responsibilities, and all of this will be done in consideration to the wider context of data sharing and bearing in mind um, what we call our three-prong approach to protect, protecting participants and sharing data. So our main focus today is going to be on identifiers, and we'll have a short exercise using Mentimeter on those. Um, and then we're going to touch on effective anonymization um, and cover some practical considerations, including common um, indirect identifiers in data um, for both qualitative and quantitative data. We're also going to have a, a, a second Mentimeter exercise at the end to sort of help us revisit um, some of the uh, techniques in anonymization. Um, yeah, and then we'll have hopefully some time then for Q&A at the very end as well. So anonymization, um, it's a valuable tool that allows data to be shared while also preserving privacy. Um, every data source is a little different and there's a number of different factors that you need to consider, such as the different types of data, um, different types of identifiers to be aware of, as well as different levels of disclosiveness that one can aim for. Just to emphasize here, Assessment of risk of disclosure and subsequent anonymization should be iterative. So this is not a linear process. There's no single point where this should be assessed, but rather you should think about all the places that data are stored or presented. So the risk of, for example, publishing with data extracts should be considered alongside uh, you know, sharing data with colleagues or with your research team, um, sharing across institutions, or even just storing the data on your computer. This session will give a better understanding of what to look out for and why, along with different techniques and options available. We're also keen to ensure researchers understand that data and anonymization techniques don't exist in isolation, and that ethical considerations, things like informed consent, confidentiality, um, withdrawal rights are also um, clear. Um, and that those data sharing strategies, so for example, access control, user agreements, data security, are considered throughout um, and, and comprehensively. Additionally, I want to note that inf information that's presented here is influenced by and aligned with our current UK legislation as of June 2024. Um, I'm sure many of you may be aware that we've called a general election, so you know, in a few months time, keep an eye on this space. So um, we're gonna be presenting the terms and concepts as they're used by the UK Data Service. And that may be different from what you have seen before in other places. Um, we're gonna go through the definitions of these. So hopefully you're on board from the start and can kind of coincide um, uh, that with what you already know. So to begin with, I just want to emphasize that we um, encourage employing a three-prong approach, um, and that includes the anonymization of data, but also regulating access to the data and obtaining consent to share data. Um, so this ensures that it's not only legal, but it's also ethical. Um, so rather than thinking about anonymization as something, again, that you would only do once, thinking think about how it affects all stages of research including carefully considering the grounds for which you're processing the data and the information that you're providing participants, um, anonymi anonymizing data files, 
um, considering access to those files once they're ready to be shared. So all three of these elements kind of combine to form a stronger ethical grounds for sharing with um, sharing and processing data. <clears throat> now the focus today are the types of identifiers. And um, we're looking at both direct identifiers and indirect identifiers, and also discussing the most common indirect identifiers. So we're looking at different types of data. So for example, survey data, transcript data. We've also got just a, a slide about audio and visual data as well. And we're therefore asking what to look out for, why, which techniques um, and options are available. It's not possible to delve into everything um, around this, but we do need to just establish this key terminology as well as briefly touching on additional considerations for that three-prong approach, um, including uh, consent and access control. So the definitions, we'll start there. What are we anonymizing exactly? So according to the UK General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, and the Data Protection Act 2018, researchers must adhere to data protection requirements when managing or sharing personal data. So we have hyperlinked all the additional resources here. So once the slides are available after this workshop, you can find more additional information online. Okay, so we're, we're talking about this in light of GDPR and the DPA. From the guidance that's published by the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, Personal data is clearly defined within those policies as information that relates to an identified or identifiable living person, be it directly or indirectly. This also includes information which can be gleaned from existing available sources outside of your own data set. So there's two things to stress here with this definition. First is that personal data includes indirect identifiers. So we'll expand on that in a little bit. But it's not simply just names, for example, that we need to consider. Second, this also includes piecing information together based on what's already available, be that another data set or other publicly available information. We also have to think about special category data or sensitive personal data. Sensitive personal data um, it is a specific subset of special categories that must be treated with extra security. So again, this is defined within the UK GDPR. They list the very specific categories. So this includes racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, genetic data, biometric data, health data, on data about a person's sex life or sex orientation. Okay, so this all needs special um, treatment as well. Finally, in the UK, we also have, just to make it even more interesting, the Statistics and Registration Service Act. So this further builds on those definitions um, and we need to bear this in mind as well. And it introduces the concept of personal information. So this is, for example, information relating to either a natural person or a body corporate. The key difference is information about a limited company or another legal entity, um, something which does not normally constitute personal data, which is about a living person. So it wouldn't fall within the scope of the UK GDPR. However, this information would constitute personal information, and it is subject to the Statistics and Registration Service Act considerations, okay? So um, personal information needs to be considered as well, where corporate bodies might be identifiable. Okay, so we've covered the applicable legislation, so let's have a look at consent and participant communication it's important to differentiate between consent from a legal view and consent from an ethical view. So consent um, can be used as one of your legal basis for processing personal data. However, for research within the UK, the most common basis is either public task, 
Um, and this is for, you know, usually for public bodies or authorities. Um, so this would be organizations that are processing data while carrying out tasks in the public interest. So if you work with the NHS, with universities, with our um, uh, research councils, UKRI, and so on, all of those normally public, um, normally process data on the basis of public task. There is also, however, legitimate interest. So if you're working for a non-public body, so for example, charities or commercial companies, you can also process data on the basis of legitimate interest. We always, or well, we always, we should hopefully always be collecting informed consent um, when we're doing research. However, the informed consent is an ethical perspective. Um, and, and that is normally considered no matter what your legal basis is for processing the data. So you always, hopefully, should be informing your participants about your plans for collecting, using, and sharing their data. Um, but you should also tell them that the actual legal basis that you're using to process the data is either, well, normally public task, potentially also legitimate interest, right? So we do collect consent, but it's not our basis for processing the data. It's something that we do because it's the ethical thing to do. So when I presented that three-prong approach, I also mentioned about accessing um, sorry, about regulating access uh, control to the data. Best to put this in practice um, is our three-tier license and access framework that we use at the service. So when you deposit data with the UK Data Service, um, we license the collection under an appropriate access option. So we do have different levels. So there's open, safeguarded, and controlled. So open data means data can simply be downloaded from our data catalog without any registration. So this would only be applied to data that is not in any way personal data or personal information and where consent to share the data has been put in place. So for example, collections of data from public figures, um, for data where steps need to be taken so that the risk of re-identification is unlikely, um, what the ICO would class as something that is effectively anonymized, um, that would fall under our safeguarded option. So the data is treated, there are anonymization techniques in place, um, <laughs> um, but there is an extra safeguard there where it's needed. And what the safeguarded option does is put in place a legally binding end user license agreement between the service and the user. And the agreement ensures that the data is legally and ethically um, shared and that secondary researchers understand their responsibility when handling that data. Um, so for example, our end user license stipulates that in the very unlikely event, you are able to re-identify a participant that end user license ensures that the reuser would not share that identity onward, right? So safeguarded is where there may be some concerns about a residual risk of, anon uh, sorry, of re-identification, but it is by ICO standards effectively anonymized. And then finally, we have our controlled. So um, access to this data is only supplied through our five safes framework, and that's because the controlled option is for any data which is considered sensitive or personal data or personal information. So it would require you to apply for access to the data in a secure environment only once you've undertaken specialized training and where all puts released from the environment are double checked to ensure that there's no identifiable information released in those outputs. As we've now discussed consent, um, and we've seen some examples of access levels, we're going to delve into the identifiers now. So what are identifiers? Well, identifiability is simply being able to distinguish one person from others. Often an individual's name uh, put together with some other information is sufficient enough to be able to identify them. And identifiers are classed into two main groups, direct, 
So this is information that directly identifies the subjects without any other information needed and indirect. So information that in combination may uniquely identify uh, data subjects. You need to note here, of course, that information can potentially be linked to other sources of data, such as the electoral register, to be able to identify someone. So that would be an indirect identifier, but again, you'd still be able, with other sources, um, able to identify someone. Sometimes some of those characteristics, like a name, could be considered a, a direct identifier if it's a name that is quite unique. Other times, let's say your name is John Smith, that's actually an indirect identifier because the name is so common that actually you still might need some other information in order to know which John Smith. Okay, so I'm hoping this works, but if you go to menti.com, we're just gonna pause here and see if you've got the gist of direct identifiers and indirect identifiers. So if you go to menti.com, and type in the code 45939026, as it just appears right here on the top of the slide, you should be able to join, and hopefully this works, and if not, we can always use the chat. Um, but if you can pop in something that you think would be a direct identifier, and I know there's a little bit of gray area, but see what kind of, what kind of identifiers you can come up with that would be direct identifiers. Excellent. NHS number, the name, potentially your date of birth. Um, you know, it might depend on the data sets. Um, national insurance number. Yeah, absolutely. If you're coming from further abroad than the UK, there's often a kind of government ID um, that's given out. So in the US, it's social security number. All of those are unique and specific. Potentially address. Yeah, those addresses can be problematic. Think also about online direct identifiers, things like IP address, um, or if you've got like a handle on social media accounts, those are gonna be specific. Email addresses, excellent. All of these are really, really good examples. Contact details, absolutely. Postcode, yeah, definitely narrows down um, who it could potentially be. So potentially postcode, especially if it's from a rural area. So again, might be dependent on the type of data, but all of those are really good examples. I'm just going, let's see if I can start Menti. We want to do the same thing with indirect identifiers. Oh, and hopefully it's working now. Um, so if you can pop in some examples of indirect identifiers. And it should be the same Menti code. Hopefully it's just changed on your screen to say that I've changed the slide. Yes, it works. Some indirect identifiers. So yeah, your name is one of those funny ones. Depends a little bit on the name, but absolutely could be um, your employer, um, a Facebook name. Yes, maybe not the Facebook URL though, right? That might be a direct identifier, but the name itself. A job position, it might depend on the job. If you're a football coach for, you know, Ipswich Town in 2024, you're likely to know who that is. But if you're just a football coach, it's a much broader pool. Um, yeah, excellent. Health status, medical diagnosis. Again, might depend on the medical diagnosis. If it's a particularly rare um, diagnosis, that might that might be a, a more direct identifier, but definitely all of these um, could be working as indirect identifiers. So excellent. I think hopefully we've got, got that. So those are all fantastic. Um, we have added some common potential identifiers um, into this presentation as well. A key consideration is that often what's listed as a direct identifier, like a, like a name, may not easily identify a person. So like I said, if you've got a common name like John Smith, you might need other information. The UK GDPR makes it clear that other factors can identify an individual. So these include <clears throat> one or more factors specific to the physical, physiological, genetic, 
mental, economic, cultural, or social identity of that natural person. So these sorts of characteristics can help to uniquely identify a particular individual as they tell you something about them. So if you're unsure if the information is considered personal data, the ICO guidance right now states that you should treat it as if it is personal data. Um, part of the reason behind this guidance is not just out of precaution, uh, but you know certainly it is a precaution you would take, but just to reiterate that information can become identifiable when it's combined with additional sources of information. So if you're unsure if it's personal data, you need to be wary of the possibility that somebody, somebody else might be able to combine it with other information that's publicly available. And that's something as simple as Googling, for example. So if you're not sure if somebody's job title, for example, is, a, is an identifier, well, just be aware that if somebody hops on Google and starts Googling it, and they can identify someone, then that would be considered personal data. Um, the ICO provides in-depth information about personal data and the guidance for de-identification and anonymization within uh, their legal framework. We also um, like to make it clear that there's a distinction between these terms. Um, that they're talking about here. So de-identification of data refers to removing the direct identifiers. So this includes any identifiers that lead directly to the re-identification of, of individuals. So data that remains identifiable um, <coughs> without any other information. Anonymization, however, is the process of ensuring that the risk of identifying someone is negligible. So this usually involves more than de-identification and requires further editing of the indirect identifiers. So anonymization allows for the legal and ethical sharing of data while still preserving confidentiality. Effective anonymization is defined as neither personal data um, or personal information is in the data and where the risk of identification is considered sufficiently remote. Um, so effective anonymization is a really useful concept the ICO has introduced. And it is basically just kind of saying it's anonymization um, where there is a negligible risk of re-identification. There is a relationship, however, between anonymization, data utility, or the ability to use data for a range of purposes, access control, so again, who can get a hold of that data, and information loss. So as data moves from personal data to anonymized data, the data utility goes down and the information loss goes up, but more people can access it, right? So open data, data that has been anonymized sufficiently has had some information loss that you've had to take something out of it. Um, this could affect the range of, of uses that that data could have, but more people can access it. Um, obviously the original personal data would have the greatest usage um, and, and the most information, right? But fewer people would normally be allowed to access that data. So how do we balance all these different aspects? Um, and specifically, how can we hopefully maintain at least a lot of data utility while also anonymizing the data? And this is where I said the ICO has introduce this concept of effective anonymization. Um, the, they provide guidance on determining whether information qualifies as personal data or anonymous information, affecting the applicability of data protection laws um, there. So the assessment involves careful consideration of the risk of identifiability and the factors that influence it. And with this concept comes several different categories. Um, based on how identifiable an individual is. And this includes directly identifiable data. So this is, this is personal data, indirectly identifiable data. And this would still fall under personal data, but the risk of identifiability is, is you know, is lower. Um, it's not sufficiently low, but it's lower than directly identifiable uh, data. You have data that's unlikely to be identifiable, 
so the risk of identifying an individual is considered sufficiently low. And then you have data that is impossible to identify. And this represents, you know, genuinely anonymous information. So on the slides, we have linked to the ICO guidance and it provides a really fantastic graph on page nine that kind of shows the data existing as a spectrum. And it um, kind of acknowledges, you know, where research data might kind of fall within that spectrum. So it's a useful concept, I think, to help us kind of find some balance between these. And here's an example of where you might need to take some additional factors into account when anonymizing data. So starting with personal data, you can just take out the direct identifier. So here, I've just taken out the name. However, further contextual information might make you decide to change other information. So for example, in this, uh, in this sentence, the uh, mention of Bakersfield Hospital, um, they do offer chemotherapy treatment, but it's unusual to receive it there. So most are sent to Churchill Hospital um, for their treatment. So you might start to think that actually, you know, Bakersfield Hospital may need to uh, be changed, or you might also discover that, and I'm just making things up here, Bakersfield Hospital specifically only does chemo treatment on certain types of cancer, um, so on. So you might decide that that's an indirect identifier, especially given that there is a date for the treatment too. So you might decide to change some of those elements too. And then finally, the age of the participant. It is still quite young, uh, 45 for cancer treatment. Um, we are seeing this as a kind of changing landscape, but you might decide that actually, given the place and the date, um, you, you might need to change the, the age as well. Um, and so here I've changed it to an age range instead. Um, I did change it to the ONS the Office for National Statistics uh, age category, um, which would allow for relative understanding to national numbers. So it's something to keep in mind as well. Um, we will talk about some of these strategies um, like binning that you can do with some of these um, variables. So without further ado, let's uh, investigate some indirect identifiers in a bit more detail. So the key message here is that context is of utmost importance. So when planning anonymization, the selection of indirect identifiers must be considered in relation to the subject of your data and the sample characteristics. So the following is not going to be an exhaustive list of indirect identifiers, but rather some of the most commonly found ones and maybe some key considerations for each one. So age, um, often considered one of the most important pieces of demographic information in data. It provides precise insights into age-related trends and patterns, which are critical for many types of analyses. When handling age or date of birth information, it's crucial to consider the various formats and the implications of each for the privacy um, of the individual and data utility. The information can be presented in various formats, including the full date of birth, the day of birth, the month of birth, the year of birth, and the age given as like a single year, the age given as months, or a kind of banded category of age. While detailed age data can enhance your quality of demographic analysis, it also increases the risk of identifying individuals where outliers are present or where the information in combination with other indirect identifiers is a little bit more unusual. Um, so like in the previous example, being quite young and receiving treatment for something. Anonymization techniques can render some numeric analysis still, such as calculating the mean, uh, impossible. So, for example, if ages are grouped into bands, the precise calculation of an average age would be less accurate. Therefore, it might be, you know, better to uh, consider more detailed in for, uh, age information to be made available with additional techniques added to other variables, depending on the usage of the data and the access to it. So where you need that precision, maybe look at some of the other um, characteristics and what you might do to reduce 
um, the precision there, but still allow for things like central tendency to be calculated. Education information, just as common and of key importance to a wide range of research. Uh, this could be presented as the highest level of education, the field of study, the duration of study, or the type of institution. Like any other indirect identifiers, care needs to be taken when detailed information is provided. So this detailed information could be unique or only applicable to a very small number of people in the population. So this type of information, again, especially used in combination with other information that's been collected and is made available, could lead to a re-identification of a participant. So where possible, education information should be categorized using a coding frame. The usefulness of the information for secondary analysis, again, should be considered with multiple versions of appropriate access made available where needed. So for example, educational attainment or qualification level might be more useful than specific institutional information. The ONS Census 2021 highest level of qualification codes might also uh, be considered for this. And we've got employment information, be it occupation classification, a specific job title, the sector, um, employment type. Uh, it, it's all very similar to the um, education information and the same considerations should be taken. So where there's very detailed information that's made available, um, it, it might end up being quite unique information or information that's only applicable to a very small number of people in the population. As an example, unique job titles may result in very easily um, identifiable information uh, either in, on their own in isolation or potentially, you know, when combined with other information. It's recommended that employment information is categorized and coded. So in the UK, we are lucky because we've got a standard schema such as the standard occupational uh, classification and the national statistics socioeconomic classification. So this is the SOC 2010, SOC 2020, and the NSSEC coding frames um, that can be used to ensure privacy. And again, you can have a look at these slides um, and explore some of those links um, if you want to. On to income and other financial information, especially when unique outlying values are presented. This easily can lead to increasing the risk of re-identification. So a couple of key examples here are either very high or low incomes. And again, we're thinking about these in combination with all of the other information that might be available. Or a more specific example could be providing information about a large lottery win recorded as unearned income. This may present an increased disclosure risk when analyzed alongside some of the other information that's available in the data, plus other publicly available information. So, you know, some lottery wins, for example, are very well publicized and you can read about it in the newspaper. Um, so if you'd be able to Google that newspaper article, you might be able to re-identify that person then. Financial information needs to be carefully checked and ensure that the level of detail provided does not compromise the identity of the participants. So similar to age, some statistical analyses where individual numbers are required um, will not be possible. So data usability should always kind of be considered alongside whatever you choose to do with that particular variable. Geographic information, one of the most important indirect identifiers, but also most important information for secondary research. So this information can be varied from countries and regions to postcodes and even latitude and longitude. So geographical or spatial variables present within the data should be carefully considered. Detailed low level geographic variables will exponentially increase the ability to identify participants. So always consider the characteristics of the study, the sample size, the individual data that you're anonymizing. So for example, in a politics related study, low level political geographies 
are of key importance for secondary analysis. Further anonymization can be applied um, to other indirect identifiers, um, but it is advisable that any geographic information more detailed than regions um, should have stringent access control considered. Um, and indeed, if you if you use uh, reuse any of our main uh, survey data that's available from um, ONS um, or through the UKDS, something like some of our longitudinal studies, you'll find that if you want to access that geographical information, it requires um, you to uh, access the control data, right? So it becomes a bit of a process um, in order to get your hands on that. Similar to date of birth information, exact dates of life events may also increase the risk of potential identification. So paying careful attention to life events is especially important at some of um, this information. Again, when it's available alongside open sources might be used to identify a participant. So reducing the exact dates to a month and year might remove enough detail there when considering other information available. In other cases, reducing the exact dates to just the year um, might be needed. As always, it's important to assess how important is that information for secondary research. Um, any changes that you make will decrease that data usability. So, um, you know, looking at increased uh, access conditions might also be considered if you need to supply that more granular information. Detailed information about ethnicity, national identity, or religious affiliation can be potentially problematic when, again, used in conjunction with other variables. Detailed responses will often include unique cases. Um, using a standard coding frame is helpful and ONS provides some guidance about that complex area, which is linked to the slides. Similar to um, other indirect identifiers, the context of data sharing and the usage for secondary research should be carefully considered. Stricter access control can be applied um, to provide more detailed information. Finally, a bit more on just the sensitive information. I mentioned the special category uh, data. The previous example of ethnicity and religious affiliation is also special category data under data protection legislation. But as there are standard coding frames, they can be handled slightly more easily, um, but that's not applicable necessarily to other types of sensitive data. So data should always be checked for sensitive information. Some information may include details that could be potentially harmful. So if a respondent is identified, um, such as an unusual or sensitive health condition or status or details of illegal behavior, for example. Um, this type of information might actually just need to be edited out. But if doing so would compromise the usability of the data, you can sort of, you know, discuss more stringent access restriction um, and see where there might be a way forward there. Key takeaway message here is when anonymizing data, the combination of information, the data utility and the access of the information should also be considered. We're not simply editing one piece of information in isolation. We're considering the entire context. So let's do um, an exercise. So on the right hand side of the slide, we have included some dummy data. So imagine that you must share this data as widely as possible. Um, so we have a participant that's 21 years old. And we have their date of birth as well as detailed ethnicity information. So here it's mixed and multiple ethnic group, white and Asian. We know they identify as British and that their highest level of education is PhD in computer science and inform um, informatics. They are a senior cybersecurity specialist at Tech Secure LTD, where they have worked for one year and four months, and they earn 74,271 pounds per year. We also know that they live in postcode CO110RP. So there's quite a lot of information here. What you must ensure is you are sharing the data as widely as possible. So try to think of 
as little access controls in place as possible, but most importantly, ones that allow the analysis of career progression in the UK at a region level with key considerations for year of employment, highest level of education and occupation. Which identifiers might you change? How and why? So um, if you, we should have hopefully a mentee. Yeah, so we've got a, a another, oh, let me start this one. We've got another mentee. I might need to, I'll repeat some of the information as needed, but I want you to think about what would you change, how and why? So please enter each identifier separately with an explanation. So take your time here. We've got um, a few minutes here, um, but I wanna see what kind of considerations you're thinking about um, with the information that was just presented. Um, so the context of the data, the needed usability, again, here we're focusing on years of employment, the highest level of education and occupation. Um, and we're looking at career progression in the UK at a regional level. I'm wondering, I haven't played much with this, but I wonder if I go back so that you can have another look at the information and have a think. And then if I come back, let me just give it a go. I'm gonna go back a slide if I can. So you can have a look at the information again. And then we will go back to Menti. I'll just give you another minute with this because it was quite quick on here. Um, and we will go back to the Menti slide and hopefully it either resets or we can continue adding to it. I think once I go off the slide, Menti will kind of shut down that um, question, I think. And while you're doing, having a look at this and having a think, I'm just gonna just quickly breeze through some of these questions and see where we're at with those. Oh, someone's asked about video observation. We are gonna look at some video data in a bit. There's a couple of variables listed here that are behind this QR code, so I can't see them. But I see a lot of you are honing in on the age. Um, course postcode, excellent. The job title, excellent. Good to see that as well. I'm not sure if Mentius, um still allowing you to add in things. <clears throat> so there are quite a lot of considerations for that bit of data there. Um, so we've got the age and the qualification context. So as it, literally one of the first things someone has pointed out is given that the PhD age is 21, that is notably young. So you'll need to you know, further anonymize the exact date of birth, um, and the single year to pro, you know, looking at an age band, for example. Um, and that will help protect the identity while still allowing for the research into a unique career path for young PhD holders. Um, the ethnic group, so, you know, further uh, editing the detailed ethnic group to a broader category will help maintain some privacy while still enabling research into ethnic diversity. So finding a little bit of a balance there for, for a range of different um, analyses. The job and company details. So using a SOC 2020 code um, and omitting the company name will ensure that the individual participant won't be able to be identified, um, yet the data remains relevant for occupational studies. Um, so I, I'm not sure how many of you have used some of the um, coding tools that they have, but you can kind of type in free text what the um, job title is, and there's there is a coding tool through ONS that will help you categorize that specifically um, into their, their coding frame. Salary range. Um, so somebody has mentioned this as well, change salary range from specific to 70 to 75K. So using a salary range instead of the exact figure will help further protect the participant, especially as it's for IT job salaries. Um, so those are quite easily discoverable online via platforms advertising jobs. Um, but not removing 
that information totally is still really important to allow for a salary trend analysis within the career progression analysis. There is um, geographic information as well that should always kind of pique uh, your interest there. So, and somebody has said postcode. So replacing the specific code, postcode with a broader region helps to prevent any location-based location, location -based identification, um, but still a, a, retains that geographic relevance that might be required um, by certain analyses. Um, and, you know, we mentioned earlier, I, I mentioned earlier within the UK, you know, really thinking about using regional levels. So if you anonymize the data using those techniques, you can ensure that the data set still remains valuable for secondary research into a range of, of um, analyses, including things around career progression, salary trends, diversity. Um, so these kind of balance the need for data utility along with the imperative to protect participant privacy, and that will still enable meaningful and ethical research. Right, so this is what, <clears throat> this is what our um, uh, recoded, our anonymized data set might look like here. Okay, so how do you anonymize? Okay, we're gonna get into, um, the actual strategies now. And this hopefully will be building on the exercise we've just done. So we propose three steps to anonymization. So first, find and assess the identifiers. And this includes direct identifiers and indirect identifiers, and ad identifying any sensitive personal data. Once that's done, you can then implement anonymization techniques. And I'm going to cover a few of these in just a moment, um, unless Christina's joined, in which case she can, I'll have a look for her in a minute. Um, and finally, you'll then need to review the anonymized data, reassessing any remaining disclosure risk um, and further anonymizing as needed. In this process, you'll also want to consider what other data information is available and how that might affect the identifiability of your data. Um, and you know we've got we've got some suggestions for some strategies strategies there too. So, um, looking at anonymization techniques, <clears throat> we've got here for survey data. It's just to point out that the techniques that we use, I think, are just as applicable to qualitative data. Um, they are very similar, but sometimes the terminology is is you know, quite specific. Um, so we, we tend to kind of talk about qualitative and quantitative data. But as we're kind of talking through techniques for survey data, if you're a qualitative researcher, you might be looking at that thinking, well, actually, I can do that just as easily within my transcripts. Um, so a lot of these techniques are very similar, um, but I, I do appreciate that sometimes the terminology can be very specific for a, a specific paradigm of research. So once again, before making any changes to the data, remember that any changes should be made alongside data sharing plans to ensure that either over or under anonymization is avoided. The most common methods for quantitative data are recoding, banding, top bottom coding, and generalization. Okay, and just looking at again that terminology, if you're qualitative, you might be thinking, you know. That is very specific language, but when you see the examples of it, hopefully you can see how they might be applied to other types of data as well. So let's look at recoding, and this is also known as categorization first. Um, disclosure risk partly lies in how many people can be recognized by certain characteristics. The fewer there are in a category, the more likely it is to identify a person. So recoding or categorization means reducing the number of distinct categories of characteristics. So rather than, for example, having more um, refined categories of ethnicity, like on the left here, where Black Caribbean is distinct from Black African, these are all combined under one category of Black, helping reduce the precision and raising the number of people that would be classed as that, um, and thus helping to reduce the potential disclosure. Okay. 
A similar technique can be applied to what we call continuous variables like age or income. So you can bin those by creating categories within a range. So on the left, if the exact, uh, you know, you've got the exact income, but on the right, you can see that those have been binned. It's also worth noting that if you would want to compare your data to national population data, you should consider binning it based on ONS categories. So we kind of went through, I mentioned some of those um, for certain types of indirect identifiers. Um, have a look at, at some of those coding frames because um, they can be quite useful if you want to do any kind of comparative research. Top and bottom coding. Um, so sometimes low frequency counts means that there's a greater risk of disclosure. And it only applies to certain groups within a variable or characteristic. So for example, age itself is not normally problematic, normally. But if your age is over 100, since so few people globally make it to 100, that becomes a potentially disclosive um, variable. So consequently, you can do what we call top and bottom coding, and it helps consolidate the categories at the extremes of your distribution. So here for age, you can see both 118 and 89 were coded as 80 plus, while the remaining ages, which you know are arguably less problematic, were left as they were um, because there's more people globally. It does depend on the data sets. Age here um, is an example just because the 118, you can kind of see um, how that works when you when you want to do just the top and bottom um, coding. But again, depending on what kind of data you were collecting, what your topic was, um, age more broadly, you may need to bin those as well. Um, so it's all about thinking about what other information is available, what is the context of your data. Um, but you can also apply top and bottom coding, just help hide the extremes. Do the same thing with income, for example, just help hide the extremes, knowing that a lot of people kind of occupy that middle space. Um, so it allows you to keep the nuance um, uh, within that middle space. Finally, you can also generalize. So this applies specifically to free text data or uh, more qualitative data. So where a level of detail is provided, which makes it disclosive, you can simply edit that to reduce the, list, uh, the um, level of detail. So for example, where someone has said that they are leading cybersecurity initiatives, specifically focusing on blockchain technology security and data encryption techniques, it's quite a lot of information you could just edit it to say that they're involved in IT security and data protection, which would be a much broader area. Okay. We're gonna specifically look at some considerations of techniques for qualitative data as well. Um, qualitative research is really, it's based on, you know, as they say, Verstehen, an understanding, and it often seeks really rich, detailed information. So as such, it can be really difficult to decide what to anonymize and what to leave as is. And again, the same might go for if you have open-ended text questions in, in survey data um, as well. That detail is often considered really important context for analysis. So anonymizing the data, especially if it's overdone, can compromise the integrity of the data. Some types of data, like audio and video, are themselves direct identifiers. So we'll go through a few examples of some case studies to help you consider how you might manage this for more qualitative data. And the key with qualitative data is finding a balance in the anonymization so you can keep that context in while also protecting participants. Within qualitative data, um, one of the most used types of, of qualitative data is transcript data. So we're going to look here at techniques for transcript data first. First, any direct identifiers should be replaced with pseudonyms so that relationships within the data are maintained and there's, you know, generally a greater readability of the texts. Pseudonyms should be consistent throughout that project. And you'll want to think about how pseudonyms are assigned across the collection. So for example, um, you wouldn't want to, in a transcript, just use interviewer and respondent. 
um, especially if the respondent for every different interview is a different respondent. It means you can't do analyses across the whole um, necessarily because you don't know who is who, if you will. You might assume all respondents are the same. Um, so it, it reduces the differentiation between speakers in a collection and it, it just limits the analysis opportunities. So indirect identifiers um, can use strategies of categorize and generalize information. So where an indirect identifier has been identified, you can simply just replace the text with something that's less disclosive. Um, and again, you'll, you'll see some more examples in a bit, but categorization is where you create new categories that reduce the precision of the text. Generalization is less about creating categories and more about redescribing the text in broader terms. Um, we also see generalization on a grander scale where, for example, the transcripts themselves are too disclosive, so interview summaries and field notes have been provided instead. Um, so we do have a few collections where the transcripts themselves were just considered really challenging to deposit. So instead, they used the generalization technique, but applied it on quite a scaled level um, and gave us interview summaries instead. With consideration to transcript data, good practices include coming up with an anonymization plan from the start of the project, and then you can discuss that with the participants. So this should outline some mandatory anonymization, which is likely to be some of your indirect identifiers and any other characteristics that lead to disclosure, such as specific towns or dates, and how you're gonna treat that data. So are you gonna give it a pseudonym? Um, are you going to um, delete the day and use a month and year for dates, et cetera? Uh, how are those, you know, how might pseudonyms be assigned? Um, you should also outline potential anonymization. So anything that you think will come up in the data that you need to keep a careful eye on. So there, you might be concerned about, for example, the mention of very specific health conditions or court cases any broad topics or types of data that might be able to be cross-referenced should be carefully considered. And when you're making those changes, you can use the find and replace function. So make sure you know some of your options on doing that. Things like asterisks are often wild cards. So you can add this to, for example, the end of the verb um, to capture all the conjugations of that verb. So be sure that you review each change rather than hitting replace all. Um, it does take more tedious time to do that, but I have read transcripts where the words, you know, bigger words contained the same letters in the exact same order um, and, and they were changed unintentionally. And because you could figure out what that bigger word was, it meant you could figure out what the letters are, therefore figure out what it was that they, they changed and see what the original text would have been. So make sure you're reviewing those if you're using the kind of universal find and replace function. And finally, make sure you actually identify those changes. So sometimes that information can make a difference to the analysis. So it's important that reusers and yourself know where those changes have been made. This is typically done with square brackets, um, but you can also outline transcription guidelines and specify how it is that you're notating it. And somebody has asked about image and audio data. So image and audio data are particularly difficult to work with because the data itself is personal data. So a person's image um, and often, you know, the uniqueness of voices makes it identifiable already. So the best strategy for dealing with that kind of data is to ensure that any processing is done with consent. Um, it is possible to try blurring imaging, images or um, with audio. There's a common technique to, it's called revoicing, where you literally are repeating what's been said um, and then it's, it's in a different voice. Um, but there does come a point where you have to wonder if it depletes the value of the data too much. So for example, what's the point of supplying an image if the image is largely blurred out? 
So instead, we'd recommend ensuring there's clear consent to publish um, and use the data, you know, uh, where it, you want it to be used. Also be aware of identifying contexts um, like jewelry or tattoos or background that might be more easily identifiable. Um, if you are going to try blurring or, or doing some voice changing, use software that operates locally. So something like um, uh, GIMP, which is an open so source tool or Audacity um, are really good tools, which you can actually download onto your computer and use it on your computer. Um, if you use something like YouTube Studio, for example, which does allow you to do some of these things, it means you have to upload the original and store it on YouTube servers, um, which, which isn't ideal. Um, so you want to try and use something uh, locally on your computer. And importantly, you need to double check that you can't do the uh, undo the anonymization. So for example, if you've blurred an image, open up a copy of it and try and sharpen that image. Just use the sharpen tools and it'll, it'll help you see if you've blurred it enough, basically, where it can't be resharpened. Um, but yeah, image and audio data, happy to have further discussion about that if people are interested. But it is very difficult data um, to work with because it's identifiable by nature, okay? Um, so here's a quick example of what an anonymized transcript might look like. You can see names, dates, and regions have all been changed. This is very light touch, um, certainly hasn't been overdone. Um, and again, it's it, it might take some time, you know, make sure if, if you are working, for example, with a grant and you have a lot of transcripts to work through, make sure you've factored in the cost um, of working on those transcripts to clean them up. For all this advice about anonymization though, and um, you do have to keep your project in mind. So I'm gonna go through just three different case studies and the different approaches that they took. Um, and the first one here is the Pioneers of Social Research, which was conducted by oral historian, Paul Thompson. And he took life history interviews with leading social scientists and that included extensive details about their childhoods, their education background, their careers. Um, and because of the relative fame of his participants, so these are leading sociologists, historians, anthropologists. Um, you know, if, if you are a, an academic, you're likely to recognize at least some of those names. They are all well published and well known within their disciplines. So anonymization was a bit of a fruitless exercise and actually even problematic at times. Um, you needed to know the identities really. Um, that was the whole point of, of the project. So instead, Paul Thompson sought explicit permission from his participants to use their names. Having said that, that doesn't mean we didn't have a clear anonymization strategy in place. So when digitizing and reviewing those transcripts, we still were looking for um, places where participants talked about details of closed court cases, medical, medical conditions of others who were not involved in the study. Um, we were also looking for instances of, you know, basically reputational damage. We're a bit worried about, you know, talking about some of the inner office politics, if you will, if you will of completing a research project, you know, led to some concerns about um, what that might do to reputation of the interview we or others they were working with. So we felt there was still some clear ethical boundaries to navigate, even though there was consent in place and that covered our legal use of the personal data. We still had that kind of ethical layer as well. So we still did some light touch anonymization where it was needed. Another way you can protect participants is where you control access conditions. So <clears throat> the excerpt that I sh showed you just two slides ago was uh, an anonymized interview from this collection, The Health and Social Consequences of Foot and Mouth Disease in North Cumbria. And um, that anonymized interview um, is, is part of a, a collection that has quite a very specific kind of access uh, uh, negotiated for it. So the collection contained both interviews and diaries, and only some of the interviews were available to registered users. 
Another few of them were embargoed or, you know, embargoed means that they're kind of held back, they're inaccessible until a certain date. So sometimes data becomes less sensitive with time. Um, so in this case, it was decided to hold those back from being able to be downloaded until 2015. Data can, um, you know, become less sensitive. So if you are, if that is something you're worried about, you can also explore options of keeping it under an embargo until a sufficient time has passed. The audio for this collection is also available, but that's under what we call permission only access. So the original investigators have to approve any uses of that audio before they can be released to any reusers. Um, so this is this kind of was a, a setup where they were able to look at the specific data files and what the concerns were for that specific data file. Um, and we applied the access conditions accordingly. So you can kind of tailor it to the um, collection. Finally, I've got one more example here, and this is the managing suffering at the end of life. This is a very difficult collection because uh, its focus is on the is on continuous deep sedation until death. Um, so it's palliative care. Um, this featured a quite prominent focus, of course, on health and care of someone who, by the end of the project, when the um, investigator was looking to publish, you know, that subject had already died. So something to bear in mind is that GDPR only applies to living people. Um, but in this instance, there was a real sensitivity to the families around here, um, because this obviously is, is, you know, someone that they cared about. Um, so the PI worked with the Health Research Authority and UK Data Service to find an ethical approach to asking for permission to archive. So it was decided that at the point of collecting the interviews, they would collect them as normal with permission to use them for the project. And then they would get consent to return back um, at a later point. And they decided three months after conducting the interview, they would have a separate talk about archiving the data, what the anonymization would look like and sharing the data through an archive. And actually most participants agreed to the archiving of the data. So it, it it's a good demonstration actually about how you might have those conversations at the point of consent um, and how you might explain them even uh, in difficult situations like in this one. Um, so there was a lot of care I think put into the consent procedures for this and it is really challenging um, data I think but it also makes it so much more valuable as a data set. Um, really difficult I think to collect this kind of data so if it's something you're interested in have a look at reusing this data. Finally, checking your anonymization. So the Office for National Statistics has written about intruder tests, which involves using individuals or you know, friendly intruders to try and see if they can re-identify anonymized data. More and more data odors are um, now using these sort of intruder tests as a final check um, to see whether their data has been sufficiently effectively anonymized or not. Um, and this is a very similar kind of to the practices that are used at the service. So when we're accepting uh, data collection into our repository, we will do a quality assurance check on the data um, and make sure that it's unlikely for participants to be identified. Um, we don't call it an intruder test. Uh, we, we just call it our QA, our quality assurance check. Um, but any data that we would receive, we would have a sizable sample which we check first and foremost and see, are there any concerns? Um, and we do sometimes have a go at seeing if we can re-identify anyone where we kind of, you know, um, ask a, a couple of our colleagues, can you do some Googling and see what, what you can find, you know, of any other data sets? And we see if we can try and piece it together. Um, where there have been concerns that are raised from the sample, we then um, would normally go through uh, the rest of the data as well and kind of discuss it with the researcher, make sure that they're aware of some of the issues uh, within that data set so that they can they can effectively um, fix them. All right, so we have just a little bit more Menti now, but thinking about some of the techniques that I've just gone through. So this is sort of recoding the top and bottom banding, 
um, the categorization and generalization. So which of the following techniques are appropriate for anonymizing transcript data? <clears throat> So if you just go back into Menti, and it should be the same code, or you might have left it open. Excellent. We've got people saying largely all the, I mean, any of the options you would have picked are, are correct, right? Um, but we've got all options there. So we're going to go ahead and show the correct there. So, um, yeah, excellent. So all options are good um, for this one. What is an effective anonymization technique commonly applied to continuous variables? We're looking at continuous variables. These are things like age and income. Right. I think that's everyone answered. It is banding. Yes, you maybe could do generalization as well, but it would be a lot of work, I think, to try and re-describe. Um, but banding, definitely, you can use with um, continuous variables. And let's start this one. When considering data sharing, what are the main approaches to ensuring date, uh, ensuring participants are protected? Consent, anonymization, access control, or all three? Oh, good. I felt like a broken record at times, kind of talking about access controls and that. Um, but if you take one thing away from this, um, please do take away the, the fact that anonymization is, is one of many things you can do. So I just want to, I know there's a lot of questions that have come in. Um, if Christina has joined, at, at, it, we might be able to work our way through these. If we haven't gotten to your question by the, by the time you have to go, um, not to where I can stay a little bit later and answer some more questions, but um, uh uh, you can also email us as well. Um, but there are some further resources here. Um, we recommend all of the information from the ICO. There is also some software that you can use to kind of help you with anonymization. So if you're working, the first half of this list is, is really for um, quantitative data, SDC Micro. Um, oh, Christina's here. Hi, Christina. SDC Micro. Um, is a common package that is used. We've also come out with QA My Data. Um, and there are some qualitative um, tools as well. The qualitative tools, a lot of them, I think there's they're still developing them. And I think there's a lot of interest in the use of AI um, to kind of harness that power um, and make some effective qualitative tools. Um, but often they just kind of highlight and, and signpost you to where you might need to apply some anonymization. Um, so identifying some, some specific names in that. And yeah, so if we'll, we'll work through the questions. If you have further questions, feel free to get in touch with us. Um, there's a lot of different ways. We're kind of on social media and check out our YouTube channel, et cetera.